reason being is the unheard um, of or listened to uh, constituency in the criminal justice reform movement are black, brown, and poor victims. Uh, we uncovered that about 10 years ago. And um, part of our work was to elevate their voices in the criminal justice discussion. And what we found was that uh, crime victims wanted three things. One, what happened to them not to happen to them again. Uh, what happened to, to them would not to happen to someone else. Um, and help and healing for their community. And so that was an agenda we thought was worth investing in and supporting. And so that was the work I did uh, over the last, you know, 10 years or so. And so Reform reached out to me and asked my thoughts of like, who should be the next CEO? And I said, me. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Why not? Um, and, and so I was thrilled. I was thrilled to get the call. Uh, and, and, and Reform, uh, from my perspective over the last three years has been one of the most consequential criminal justice reform organizations in the country, uh, leveraging business leaders and influencers for, for change. Uh, reform has passed 13 pieces of legislation in eight states in three years um, and create a pathway for 500,000 people to exit the justice system. And, and so it just shows when, when business leaders and influencers come together um, real, real, real change is, 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 is possible. A little bit about kind of reform's origin story. So recording artist Meek Mill um, was on probation his, basically his entire adult life. Um, he was you know, kind of in the system. And um, he basically cut a music video. He was working. Um, and in the music video, he popped the wheelie on the motorbike. Well, the judge that was overseeing his probation didn't like the fact that he popped the wheelie on the motorbike um, and hauled him into court. Now, by the time this happened, Meek uh, was um, an international star, influencer, performed in Super Bowl parties, events, and befriended some of the most influential people in the world. And to his credit, he had the instinct that uh, something was gonna happen to him that day in court. He asked Michael Rubin, uh, owner of Fanatics, um, owner of 76ers, as well as Desiree Perez, owner of Rock Nation, uh, CEO of Rock Nation, I'm sorry, uh, to join him in court. And to, to hear them tell the story is just it's, it's, it's incredible. What Ruben's response was, man, I'm not going to court with you. It's fine. You're, you're just yeah, going. It's, no way. it's procedural. You'll be fine. It's, um, and Meek was like, no, no, no. I think you should come to court with me. So they did. They joined him in court. And for popping a wheelie on the motorbike, Meek got a two to four year prison sentence and spent. Um, a week in solitary confinement. Not a new crime, but a disagreement, misunderstanding. Um, that happens to people all across uh, this country. And so Michael Rubin and others pull their resources together and formed the Free Meat Campaign. Uh, got me um, out of prison, it took, it took him a while to get him out. Um, but to Meek's credit again, he said, this is not just about me. Right? There are millions of people that are caught in the probation and parole trap that we need to do something about. And so that was the founding of Reform Alliance. Amazing. You know, um, the fact also that you've centered on technical violations of probation and parole, is that a big part of the system? You know, why did you focus? I mean, that, of course that's what Meek had, but you who could look at the whole journey of somebody from incarceration to hopefully getting a job and thriving, you, you kind of narrowed on certain areas where you yeah. think are bipartisan and might change the game. Is that well, I, I appreciate the question because as I mentioned, I've been doing criminal justice reform work for 23 years. And by and large, the criminal justice advocacy field missed this issue. 
right? We, we were focusing on either policing, rightfully so, or too many people incarcerated, rightfully so, or the death penalty. Um, there's, there's so much um, to tackle um, when it comes to criminal justice issues. No one really was focusing on this issue of supervision and the role uh, technical violations play in feeding um, the mass incarceration problem. And so when uh, reform was founded, it really elevated this issue uh, to the forefront, and I'm so glad it did. Um, there are about uh, 6 million people incarcerated or in the criminal justice system in this country, let me say it that way. Uh, 6 million people in the criminal justice system. Uh, around 2 million are incarcerated. Um, and the rest, 4 million, are under supervision. So that means they're, um, you know, dealing with the type of stipulations that Meek was dealing with. Um, they're, they're in our community, right? They're walking amongst us, um, but they're not free. Mm. And so the probation and parole system has played a significant role um, in feeding uh, the mass incarceration problem because people find themselves under these rules and stipulations that result in their reincarceration. So there are states like Virginia where 40% of the people in prison today are not in on a new crime. They're in on a technical violation. Um, and it's a problem. And so, so reform elevated that issue uh, in, in, a, in a major way and, and in some ways mainstream it to where people are now starting to understand the problems and the challenges uh, with the community supervision problem in this country and the role of technical violations in feeding mass incarceration. And the incarceration and supervision issues, how does that affect the economy, employment, earnings? Like, because there's a lot of business people here that are looking for that link between poverty and um, incarceration and the economy? I appreciate the question. The, the truth of the matter is, let's, let's, let's bring it down to an individual, right? Let's say you are on probation and you have to meet with your probation officer around 1 p.m. Uh, you have to be uh, in your home by six because of curfew. Mm. Right. That's right. You have to pay, you know, fines and fees and um, whatever. In places like Texas, it literally goes up to six or seven hundred dollars a month to be on probation. Right. Um, where do you get a chance to work? How can you contribute um, to your family? And in many ways, probation, like everyday people, are subsidizing folks on probation, they're subsidizing the state. And when someone comes home, you need a place to stay. Um, you need someone that's gonna be able to provide for you because it's very difficult for you to provide for yourself because of the stipulations um, while on um, probation. And, and that's, that's the issue. And that's, that's a business problem, um, but also it's a community problem, right? Someone out should be given the opportunity to work, um, to thrive, um, to get reconnected with family and community, to vote. Like all those things should be attributed to someone that is out um, and it's not. And so many people are caught in this uh, web, um, this, this tripwire. And we need to do something about that. I, it's my view um, that probation uh, should not uh, be a policing function. It should be a coaching function that, that we should uh, meet with people and ask what their hopes and desires are for life, how they want to contribute uh, to community, and we should work to make sure people are connected and supported to do those very things. You don't need a gun if you're a probation or parole officer, no need for that. You don't need these you know, kind of arbitrary stipulations that really make no sense. You just need to be connected to real supports. Right. Uh, systems and jobs and, and things like that. So, so that's, that's our hope. Um, it's, it's, it's an individual problem and also it's a community problem. And if you're, if you're a business leader, if you're a business owner, um, then you should see the benefits of people being free um, as um, a benefit to your, to your business. 
um, in, your, in, in your community. And that's, that's what I hope people understand. Yeah, but how does reform deal with the, um, you know, issues in New York and the US about crime rising and people feeling unsafe and saying, whoa, 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 we should be much tougher. Oh, I love it. I, I love the question. I, pre I, I so appreciate it because that's what's on people's minds right now, right? That um, uh, crime rates um, have spiked, specifically violent crime. Um, and where is criminal justice reform um, in this conversation? It, it's my view that if we uh, invested in addressing the root causes of crime um, for the last 20 years, uh, we would not be in the situations we are in today. Uh, we, we've seen uh, prisons uh, grow 1,500% uh, uh, over a 20 year period, right? And, and we're talking about a massive increase. I mean, prisons are expensive, right? They have to be ran, they have to be staffed. Um, they're, they're, they're like, you have to build them, you know, block by block. Uh, what if we would have invested in mental health support, right? What would we invested in substance abuse treatment or, um, or healing uh, modalities that work um, in, in diverse environments in the same way, right? We would have a beloved community that support people, right? People, people fall. Um, how are we supporting them when they fall? But that's not what we have now. We have these, these massive structures um, that result in uh, warehousing uh, millions of people. Um, and people are left to their own devices in our own community. And so we've just gone through, what, two years of isolation, being disconnected from each other and being disconnected from this very few systems that are there to support us. And now we're surprised that crime is spiking. Right, so many mental health issues. So much is going on. And we were not prepared for this, not only from a pandemic perspective, but from an infrastructure perspective. Yeah. And so I think <clears throat> this is a call to action. We are in a call to action moment, uh, not to rush and do the things that we did 20 years ago, which is the instinct of a lot of people, like, oh, we need more police on the street, or we need to go back to top on crime. No, 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 that's not the call to action. That's silly. That's not what we should be doing. Uh, we should be investing in the key infrastructure things to help people in moments of isolation, in moments of desperation. Uh, and that's what I would like to see the conversation shift to, not, not just about crime rates. Yeah, we should be responsive to it, of course. Um, but how do we help people heal? That's, okay. that's the fundamental that's question, I think. How do we, we help answer. people heal? Yeah, no, that's well, well said. Um, another kind of pandemic paradox is the business labor shortage. And, you know, uh, certainly in New York, there was, well, in, in countrywide, you know, a call for more workers in hotels and restaurants, and there's this huge shortage on tech across the board, and then there are the formerly incarcerated who can't get hired. How do we, how do we bridge that? Yeah, I, 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 I don't buy it. I don't think there's, there's a labor shortage. I, I, I think uh, we, we need to, to shift. Um, the, the, the times are different. Um, than they were, um, you know, just 10 years ago. Uh, people, you know, want to work from home more. Um, you know, people are asking for different type of work conditions. And so I think uh, business should accommodate. Um, if, if our goal is to get people back uh, working and contributing. So that's thing one. Thing two, the reason why I don't buy it is because we as a society and as a country have locked out a significant number of the populace out of the work, uh, out of the economy uh, for work. And those are people with felony convictions. If you uh, have a felony conviction in this country, um, you often have to jump through additional hoops um, that are just unnecessary. Um, in order to get into 
um, um, the, the, the work uh, yeah, space. Uh, if a company has a government contract, uh, they often um, have licensing issues that bar people with felony from working. Um, if you, know, you uh, in many parts of the country, um, can't be a barber um, because you have a felony in your record. You can't be a real estate agent. Can't be a banker if you have a felony in your record. I mean, the list goes on and on. So we've created um, an environment um, where people with felony have to live as if they're second class citizens, um, specifically as relates to work opportunity. Um, but then we want to say we're in a labor shortage. Right. Right. Doesn't, doesn't compute. Uh, and so my, my, my view is that we need to bring um, real opportunity to people, uh, allowing people to work and contribute um, and, and, and not bar people from participating um, in work for things that they did 20 years ago, right? Or, 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 or uh, things that they've uh, paid their debt to society complete. Right? When they walk out, when they, when, they, when they finish their parole or when they've done the probation, they have paid their debt to society. We want to continue to hold this over their, over their head. And many people will die as a felon. And that's not right. right? That, that label should drop. Right? In, 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 in Britain, for example, um, they have a, a period of time when your time is spent, meaning after three to five years, your entire record goes away. So that's, that's what I hope um, we can do here, is that if someone um, can, 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 can come back into community, contribute to the community, and there will be a day when they don't have to worry about their record. Um, I, I think we owe it to people, um, because other than that, then they literally have the felony label for the rest of their life. And can you talk a bit, because I do remember, at, at, I think it was November, the height of the crisis, with just a few weeks notice, uh, Rock Nation and Reform did an amazing job there at Madison Square Garden. What, what's the role of business and now in second chance hiring? Like what are, what are businesses doing to support reform? Appreciate you bringing that up. Um, let me just, walk people through what, what we were able yeah. to accomplish and <clears throat> we work with you, um, pull it off. <clears throat> so um, we were coming out of COVID and we were hearing from our members, Reform has a membership community um, that um, people were not able to get work, right? That, that people were applying to jobs and um, they were not being called back and didn't have the opportunity. And at the same time, we were reading these stories about this labor shortage and it just wasn't adding up because our, our, our folks were, were frustrated. And so we worked with Rock Nation, one of the leading kind of record labels in, um, in, the, in the world and, um, and, and, and organized this job fair. Now I say job fair, um, but it was way, way more than that. Uh, when you walked in, you would see people getting haircut. Uh, you would see uh, women getting their nails and, and hair uh, worked on. Uh, you, we gave away 300 uh, suits. Yeah. Uh, we, we trained people on resume writing and how to interview. Uh, we had an expungement clinic. Um, we had over headshots. We had headshots. That's right. Legal. We, we had headshots. Yeah, that's everybody right. was like prepared on one side of Madison Square Garden yeah. to walk into the other side, which was sixty-six businesses ready to hire, right? From right. Amtrak right. to Amazon. Right. And what was so awesome? It was the week after the budget was signed, and I was looking around like, why are so many people in the Amtrak line? <laughs> people are tracking. They're like. Budget side. We we, yeah. we want to work for Amtrak. It was awesome. It was one of the most inspiring days of my 23 year career um, to see 6,000 people walk through the door of Madison Square Garden. Um, the, the agreement with the corporations were, were two. One, um, that they had to agree to offer jobs on the spot in the moment. 
Um, and two, that a felony can be a barrier for employment. And once, once employers agreed to that, we invited them in. We were only able to bring in 60, 66. There was over 100 employers on the list. So it was good to see the interest from the employment community. Um, and, and people walked away with jobs. Uh, we've, we've done research and 25% of the people that walked through the door that day were employed um, three years after the job there. So I, I love that for so many reasons. Um, one, from Reform Alliance perspective, uh, we're rolling up our sleeves and we're, we're, we're partnering with businesses, we're partnering with, uh, with government to help solve an important problem uh, to solve in our community, um, which is the lack of, lack of employment. Um, for, for people coming out of the system. That's, that's critical. Um, from a business perspective, um, you know, employers got a chance to hire people and, and get people work before the holidays. Right? Like so many people got a chance to, to work and, 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 and provide for their families and communities. So I, I, I love that. Um, and then from a policy perspective, uh, we were able to convene um, lawmakers at the job fair and they asked, what, what should we do next? Like, how can we uh, continue this momentum? Um, and so it just, it was just so right. important uh, at so many levels. Um, and we're gonna do it again. I we're hope gonna, you do more. Oh, yeah. we're, we're, we're planning one for Philadelphia. Right. Philly is a city that absolutely needs this, this type of uh, uh, support um, and capacity. We're planning a, a one later in the year in Atlanta. Um, you know, these are, these are cities that have been hit hard, um, and our folks, um, you know, have, have bore the brunt of it. And we want to make sure we're, we're, we're there helping people and get what they need to be reconnected and provide for their families and communities. And can I ask, and forgive me for not knowing, you have three teenage boys? Oh. Right? You have three yes. teenage boys. So when you think about as they get older, what are the economic things that that could make a shift, like if you look at the world of crypto and entrepreneurship and NFTs, do you see anything having a play in just justice reform? Uh, Malcolm is 16 and Robert is 14. Um, they're all in high school and um, they just, they're my inspiration and motivation for life. Uh, the, the excitement that I have um, around um, the, just what's happening in the blockchain space, opportunities for them and also for the people that uh, we, we care about, I think are endless. Um, first and foremost in Web3, um, people don't care if you have a record, right? Like it's like, you don't, you don't have a record in Web3. It's, it's about your value. Like what are you bringing into the space? Um, and I think that we are going to see the largest transfer um, of, of wealth we've seen in our lifetime over the next 10 years um, in the Web3 community. And I want our people to be at the forefront of that. You know? And so I'm excited about um, the opportunities in blockchain um, in the Web3. Um, and I want to position uh, reform and our members uh, in a way that allows them to benefit from that. Because uh, we can create the world we want. Right, we can create the community we want, uh, and so that's that's it's just super exciting for me. And, it's such a good yeah. vision. There's a lot of students watching. Is there any ways that students can get involved in reform? Absolutely, text reform to eight one four one one. That that is our uh, kind of membership engagement program. Um, join us. Um, help volunteer for an event. Uh, we'll be hosting job fairs, hope we'll come back to New York um, and host a job fair in partnership with the Brooklyn Net, um, you know, in, 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 in the coming uh, months. Uh, just work with us. We're going to be engaging uh, legislators, asking them to uh, support um, our, our laws uh, that we're, I mean, our bills that we want to turn into laws. Um, you know, join us, join our family. Um, from the business perspective, take a look at your, your, your hiring practices. Um, see if there are just unnecessary barriers um, for employment. Um, so it's, it's two things too. It's barriers for employment, but also barriers once people are employed 
yep. to keep people, right? So, so what we're saying is that um, there's been a shift in the business community where, 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 where people with felony convictions um, are being hired, right? More than before. Um, but they're not like moving up in companies, right? Um, they're actually staying at the level that they brought in. So what's what's going on yeah, with that, right? On. So we we need we need to ensure that people once hired are being supported to move up um, the, the the corporate ladder. So I, I would love for companies to just take a look at what's going on um, and 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 both eliminate barriers, but also create programming that allows people to move up um, and 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 contribute um, in the ways that others are contributing. And so that's 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 what our that's our hope um, for Columbia. Thank you so much for creating this space yeah. to have this conversation. We have uh, two Columbia graduates on our board, Robert Smith, um, as well as Robert Kraft. Um, he, you know, the, both of them are uh, mentors uh, to me and um, are tremendous leaders um, in the in the business community um, and are creating the. The, the path or or, or, or or showing us how business leaders can be involved in social justice. And so um, I just would love for others that are, are coming up um, in this space to, to not just think about business, but also think about social justice um, and how we can create a better yeah, world Yeah, such a tomorrow. good vision for a better world. And thank you, Robert Rooks. No, thank Does you. anybody have any questions, Sandra? Oh, yes. I have a few audience questions. The first one is from Rose, and her question is, what is your stance on how prison labor in USA is providing a practically free labor force for many companies in the US, and therefore, is there an incentive for companies to decrease prison populations if this labor is providing this benefit? So there are a couple of questions in that, Rose. <laughs> um, I, I totally agree with, with the sentiment, which is we should not be incentivizing incarceration. And, and, and that's what we're doing, not just from a business standpoint, um, but also from a public sector standpoint. Like, you know, the public sector unions are advocating to ensure that people are incarcerated. Businesses are advocating to ensure that people are incarcerated. We shouldn't have that, those types of incentives. Um, incarceration should not be someone's path to get, you know, their child through college. Um, we, we should be uh, solving, you know, social problems when it comes to public safety. Period, and so I I, I I totally agree with 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 the, with the sentiment. The way that plays in is different state by state. So every state has different set of laws. The state of Texas, unfortunately, is one of the largest um, manufacturers and distributors of beef, um, and it's people in the prison system that's you know packaging the beef. Um, that should not be the case. Um, at all. Um, at the same time, we, we do want people while they're, while they're in uh, to, to be able to um, have a craft or be able to uh, do things that they didn't coming in. So it's, 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 it's balanced, but it should not be uh, led by industry, right? It shouldn't, it shouldn't increase the bottom line of corporations. It should be all about public safety. Um, so so, so that's, that's, that's how I view it. Um, you know, but we have a long way to go in terms of getting both and businesses aligned with, with, with that vision. And then one more. Um, do you believe capital has a moral purpose? If so, what is that purpose? Do I believe capital has a moral purpose? Mm -hmm. I think capital is capital. And what you do with it, right? It's, it's an expression of the person that has the capital, right? So capital itself is just that, it's like chairs, right? Um, but if I choose to allow people to sit um, in a chair that are homeless, right? Then now I'm, I'm, I'm actually using my capital for a more, more pre, uh, reason. So, um, you know, that's, that's why I think organizations like Reform are so important is that we're leveraging people with capital, right, to advance uh, social change and make real impact. And as someone that's been doing this work um, for two, over two decades, I've seen the impact, right? Uh, I've been stopped at airports uh, when 
someone has, has, has said, hey, I was incarcerated, um, but because of a law that you passed, I got out. I got my kids back. Um, I now own a home, right? And so th th those are, those are, that's real life. And so that's how we leverage capital. We leverage capital in order to make that happen. Um, so that's 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 my view on it. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I get the question, but I would I would love for her to like take it to a step further, right? Like how how can we leverage it to make real change? Um, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for being here. Um, so my question is about um, the kind of growing calls to defund the police, especially after the Black Lives Matters protests over the last few years. And what are your thoughts on this? And is that one point of view or is there also another point of view that we should be investing more to change the system? Yeah, so I've um, been doing this work for, for a while. Um, the conversation around defund is not a new conversation to me and those of us in the field. Uh, we actually have been working to move resources from bureaucracy into uh, community programming for a while, right? And so all defund was was just an expression of that. Um, and the rest of the world got a chance to be educated on the fact that uh, you know police bureaucracies um, are too large and often ineffective. So um, unfortunately, we it wasn't packaged in a way um, that educated people. It was, it was, it was politicized quickly. Um, and when things are politicized, they get weaponized. And, and, and so I, I would love for people to take a step back and, and look at how can we solve problems in front of us today? And whether or not our budget, city budgets, county budgets, state budgets reflect um, our desire to solve those problems. That's it, full stop, right? And now I'll let you know what you should be doing. I guess I have a related question on just gonna get a sense of how you think about the, the politics of the next two years. Um, <laughs> you know, because you, you spoke about um, legislation that you've helped pass in a number of states and so on. But um, when I think of going back to our question, there was like a, a national movement that we saw post George Floyd, which is gone, you know, and, and the, the people who are running for office now have a tough on crime approach. And there's real fear in, in the streets, but there's, there's even there are people who go to the school yeah. who are afraid to come here because of where we are located and so on, right? Which is the wrong approach. I mean, to be clear on that. But um, I just want to get your response. Like, how how confident are you about the next two to four years and the possibility of passing national legislation around police reform? Yeah, I um, I'm as confident as I was the prior fifteen before. Right? It's like the work is the work, and those of us that's that's been in. We, we've been in these state houses uh, before Floyd, right? And it was difficult before Floyd. And we, during Floyd, we did have some headwind and that our, our, our approach, it doesn't change our strategy. Um, I think we will continue to win um, in, in the state houses. We'll continue to, to uh, victories and, and make impact. Um, my concern um, is, which is, what this this next kind of generation of young people, how they're experiencing crime, and what are we offering up as a solution to what they're experiencing? Um, and so I'm going to do everything I can to to participate in that conversation, right? Like and offer up, like there are ways we can address the issues that people are experiencing. That's not how we did it 20 years ago, right? That's actually uh, progressive and create opportunities for people. Um, so that's, that's what I'm excited about. But in terms of the impact, the policy impact, I think we'll continue to win. Um, we, you know, yes, people are politicizing and weaponizing 
the issue. Um, but what I see on the ground, we just passed a law in Florida, reformed it um, two weeks ago. Um, in, in, in this current environment that will impact 150,000 people in the next five years, get them out of the uh, probation system in the state of Florida. Now, we will continue to do that because um, that's just what we do. But the national discourse is one that we all need to weigh in on and ensure that uh, the solutions that are offered are different. Hello, uh, good morning. Um, so my question is uh, sort of changing gears a bit, uh, climate change related. Uh, obviously, you know, it's another global issue um, for humanity, I guess. And I was wondering if reform has any specific programs or if it's at all, you know, in your scope of um, goals and objectives to also tackle that sort of issue, given that probably you know, a lot of the mitigation and adaptation efforts would need to be um, focused towards, you know, this segment of the population. We can close prisons. How's that? That's what I would like to see from a climate change perspective. Let's, let's close some prisons. Um, but no, reform is narrowly focused on probation and parole issues. We're uh, trying to uh, reduce, significantly reduce the number of people in the criminal justice system. It, it, we're, we're, I, I love that about reform. We're narrowly focused. Um, we're metrics based. I can tell you next year how close we are, how closer we are uh, to, to, the, to that goal. Um, but we, we absolutely want to be good community and good community members and good partners in the overall global conversation for sure. Um, but, but yeah, we're super focused in that area. Okay. Hello, uh, thank you so much for this conversation it was very insightful for me. I have a question and it's like, how can we, you know, change the idea in companies that hiring somebody who is looking for a second chance is not only a matter of charity or is not charity, but it's also a person who with a huge potential and with the skills that we all of us uh, also have. So this conversation has been happening for about 15 years that I can recall. Uh, I remember one of my first meetings in 2010 uh, with Walmart. And we, I was working for NAACP at the time. So we had engaged Walmart on what we called at that time, banning the clock. So, you know, asking someone whether or not they had a felony on their record early in the application process, right? So we asked Walmart, can you just eliminate or move the box down, like do something with that box? Um, and they said, they'll get back to us. And they surveyed their stores and their managers asking what they thought about this. Well, their response back um, from their perspective was surprising. What they, were, what, what they heard back was, um, that many of their stores, their store managers, were already hiring people with felonies on their record. And in fact, they were their best employees, their best, most committed employees. We need to get those stories out there, right? Like we need to let other companies know um, that when you make a bet on someone, that they'll make a bet on you, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's what I hope we continue to do. Um, from a reform alliance perspective, but also what I would love business leaders to do is just tell the story of what's happening. Uh, I worked on a piece of legislation in California called Proposition 47. I was leading organizer for it. We won, it changed low level felonies to misdemeanors and just allowed, allowed a, just a lot of people to just get reconnected um, back in their community and get to work and so forth. So Uber, this is early days, was. 47 was passed in 2014. I think the Uber project was 2016. So they did a survey of their drivers and um, they basically uh, found out that people that benefited from Prop 47 had a higher satisfaction rating than the other drivers. So, you know, it's there. Like folks will show up for you. Uh, we just need to get those stories out there. I appreciate the question.
I have one too. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. Um, and my question uh, is really that um, about so much of the national decarceration movement, um, specifically reformist decarceration movement, uh, has the collateral damage of expanding the parole system and ex oh, yeah. expanding surveillance. Um, and I'm wondering how you, it, having such a specific focus, uh, relate to movements and not necessarily movements, but policies that are actually looking to decarcerate while expanding all of these other forms of, of uh, yeah, surveillance and, and carcerality. Yeah, reform is really clear. Like we, we have we have a do no harm policy, right? Like internally. So we are going to advocate for probation and parole reform, um, but 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 not to expand, right? We need to get people out the system entirely. Uh, that we want states to reduce the number of people in prison. We understand that they may also include increasing the number of people on probation, what on parole. What our view is that should be for a short period of time, right? Like people should not be on misdemeanor probation more than a year, uh, felony uh, probation more than two years. They should not be in parole more than three years. That's 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 just our view. Um, and and so if people think that solving um, the mass incarceration problem is to expand the parole and probation issue it's like we they, they won't have our support uh thank you so much um for sharing your experience um and i think that the work that you do are great um i go to school of social work in colombia um so um like i pursue the concentration in social enterprise administration is what exactly like you're doing. And um, from my own experience and from like the experience from my peers, um, sometimes we feel very tired of like um, bringing, like we try our best to bring changes to the society and we want to help others, but then sometimes it's tiring. I believe that you um, you probably had experience like this as well. So could you share like, um, um, was there like a time that you felt very discouraged um, and how did you deal with that? Because I believe that a lot of our peers um, want to hear like how you dealt with that and like we, we how you continue to do the work that you're doing. Thank you. Well, first of all, I really appreciate the question. Also, um, I'm an MSW from UConn, right? So love it when social work is in the room. Um, I, 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 I think that, um, you know, this, this work definitely is, is one that um, can be taxing, right? And, and um, you have to find ways to kind of rejuvenate yourself and take care of yourself, um, number one. Like, you, you just... You only get one of these, right? Like you gotta, you gotta figure out how to make sure, it, you know, uh, you 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 keep going. And um, from the from the work standpoint, um, it it can be uh, very difficult, challenging. The things that impact me the most um, isn't the challenges of passing laws or making impact. The, the thing that upset me the most. Um, is when we infight, right? It's, 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 it's when, um, you know, the criminal justice community kind of comes in on, on, on themselves um, and have purest tests and um, it's just unnecessary, right? Like we're all trying to um, create opportunities for people. We're all trying to win and we all have a role. And, and so if, if we can, you know, like just continue to like push, outward instead of, um, you know, um, cave in on, on, on ourselves, then I think we'll, we'll be fine. Um, but that's, that's what, that's what hurts me. It's, it's, it's actually debilitating. It's like, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's come together and let's work together. Let's figure this out. And then last question, 
Our audience is interested in knowing where do you think reform will be in the next 10 years, given your current progress and the movement that you're you're taking on? Oh, that's a great question. A um, couple of things. One, we are um, planning to be in 16 jurisdictions, that's states and, and counties, uh, 16 jurisdictions in states that um, have 70% of the supervised population, right? So um, I don't wanna add any additional states. I think if we can make real change in those 16 jurisdictions, it will have a ripple effect um, in, in other places. Uh, what I do, what I would like to do um, is raise more money and get that money out to the field. There are folks on the ground in communities that are working really, really hard um, to support their neighbors, right, to, to um, provide, you know, treatment and reentry services, and they're, 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 they're not invested in. And, and so I think reform, given um, our board and our influence can, can go a long way in elevating the issue, elevating those groups, bring more money into the field. So I guess, the, the, the answer is we're, we're at the bottom of the funnel and I'd like us to be at the top of the funnel, right? And bring more people in and bring more resources and get resources to folks at the bottom of the funnel. No, I just um, thank you for your questions. Great You're questions. Quite, yeah, really awesome. good questions. Um, great engagement. And um, the hour so went by so fast. Crazy, I know. I kept waiting for you to do like some kind of <laughs> uh, time's up. Uh, but thank you so much. There is so much that students, alumni, and businesses can do to change the game uh, in prison reform. So we thank you so much for your attention. And I thank Robert Rokes. He's an incredibly busy man uh, for coming and spending this morning with us at Columbia. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Beth. <laughs>